Howdy folks, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles, and today we have an Atago replay for you, courtesy of World of Warships live streamer, Only the Wicked. And of course, as is customary by now, link down below in the video description to his Twitch live stream. So, the Atago. You know, before we start talking about the Atago, I want to talk a bit about the ship that it replaced, the Kitakami, uh, which was also a Tier 8 Premium. And the first Tier 8 Premium to be introduced into World of Warships back in the closed beta. The Atago has the distinction, I suppose you could call it, of being the first Tier 8 Premium ship introduced to the game post-release. But it wasn't the first Tier 8 Premium. The Kitakami holds that title. The Kitakami was removed from the game, and the Atago was the ship that was credited to you in compensation for the removal of the Kitakami. Why was the Kitakami removed? Well... There was a very good reason. You see, the Kitakami was basically, and remember it's a Tier 8 Premium, it was basically the Kuma, the Japanese Tier 4 light cruiser, or destroyer leader, depending on your point of view. Except it was a Tier 4 Kuma at Tier 8 as a Premium with 40 torpedo tubes. <laughs> yes, that's right. Not four. No, no. 40. I can't remember... The range of the torpedoes. I think they were 12 kilometer. They may have been 10 kilometer, but they were fairly long range torpedoes. And it could fire 40 of them. 20 from each side. The carnage. <laughs> you can imagine the carnage, particularly for friendly destroyers who were charging ahead in order to grab the caps and spot the enemy team. When you've got a couple of these things on your team from behind, launching 40 torpedoes from behind you, you can imagine the carnage amongst friendly destroyers. Yeah. And that's pretty much why the Kitakami was removed, and the Atago became the first, post-release, Tier 8 Premium, and the ship that was given to all of those very unhappy Kitakami users who'd had their toy taken away from them, myself included. But the Atago is still a good ship. In fact, it's definitely a much more useful ship than the Kitakami ever was. It's just not as funny. <laughs> it's essentially a Tier 8 version of the Miyoko. It's got the same A, B, C, X, Y, 5 turret arrangement. It's got the same number of 8-inch guns. But there are some differences. The overall handling of the ship is better. As you'd expect, it's Tier 8, not Tier 7, after all, like the Miyoko upon which it's based. Its high explosive shells are absolutely lethal. And, well, as you can see, the armor-piercing shells, when fired into the broadside of a target, as you'd expect with 8-inch armor-piercing, they're not bad either. It's pretty quick. In fact, it's very quick, with a base top speed of 35.5 knots. And it's incredibly stealthy. With the right captain skills and equipment, you can get the surface detection range of this thing down to 9.1 kilometers. It's also got more torpedoes than the Miyoko. Um, it comes equipped with quad rather than triple torpedo launchers, and the torpedoes have much more usable firing angles, unlike on the Miyoko, where it can basically only fire its torpedoes in the rear quarter. Um, one torpedo launcher on each side of the Atago is actually capable of firing slightly ahead. So you take a cruiser that's pretty quick, very stealthy, has a devastating broadside of 10 8-inch high explosive shells, with a very good chance of setting a fire on target, and if you're starting to see parallels between the Atago at Tier 8 and the Zhao at Tier 10, congratulations, because that's pretty much what this ship is like. It's kind of like a mini Tier 8 Zhao, and that's no bad thing. Just like in the Zhao, providing there's no carrier on the enemy team to ruin your good intentions, you can basically, with that 9one kilometer surface detection range, dictate the terms of the engagement. You can get in a position where you can fire first when you're good and ready for it, and if things don't look like they're going according to plan, just stop shooting and motor on out of there, while dropping, you know, 16 or so torpedoes behind you to dissuade anybody who might be interested in pursuing you. Oh, and of course, how could I forget the icing on the cake? For a very long time in World of Warships, the Atago was the only Tier 8 cruiser that came with the repair party. Yep, this ship gets a heal. So, it's all good, yeah? Well, not quite. I mean, it's still a very good ship, but it's kind of got a bit of an exposed citadel. 
you really don't want to get shot at by battleships in this thing if you can possibly help it. Staying at range and kiting keeps this ship alive. Also, its anti-aircraft suite is a bit on the crap side. I mean, at the time the ship was built, this ship did actually exist. It's not a paper project. It was considered to have very strong anti-aircraft defences. But it relies heavily on lots, 28 of them, lots of 25mm Japanese auto cannon, and they're short-ranged, and they're also not that good. Its secondaries are dual-purpose, and they do have a better range, but they're kind of weedy, and it doesn't have a lot of them. So this ship is definitely vulnerable to attack from the air. Also, its modules are quite easily knocked out, and its turret traverse is kind of slow too, although it's faster than the Miyoko, but it's still not great, although you can obviously mitigate that with the expert marksman skill. But the slow turning turrets are an issue, particularly if you're close to an enemy that's manoeuvring heavily, while you are also manoeuvring heavily. Yet another reason why you would want to keep this ship as far away from any danger as you possibly can. Because the further away the target is, the less you have to turn the turrets to be able to track and shoot at them. Just about the only other downside of this ship would be the reload. 15 seconds. It's actually a second longer than the Miyoko at tier 7, which seems surprising, but, well, just about everything else about this ship is better. And these 10 8-inch high explosive shells, as you can see, they do hit kind of hard. <laughs> they hit kind of hard indeed. Yeah, that is one very optimistic uh, Ognavoy. If he thinks he is going to survive jumping out in front of an Atago, a Baltimore, and I think also a Cleveland, just to get some torpedoes off, well, he's got another thing coming. Should be able to get one more salvo out before he ducks into cover on the far side of the island. Shots out. And... Oh, robbed! Wait, no, he's on fire! Uh, no, somebody else took the kill. Well, that was just daylight robbery. But, well, you know, all's fair in love and war. It doesn't really matter who got the kill. All that matters is that the Ognavoy got killed, because that's the team's first kill. They're down three ships to one. They've been down two caps to one for large portions of this match so far, although they're contesting Alpha. And the enemy team are almost 200 points ahead. And then just when you thought things couldn't get any worse, the enemy Lexington sinks the Bismarck, the enemy team now go more than 300 points ahead, and just to add insult to injury, they're flipping Bravo, the only capture point that Oni's team actually holds at the moment. So they've got no more points coming in, they've still only sunk one enemy ship, they're down four, it is not looking good at all, and Oni is now starting to attract a lot of attention, but rather than run away and kite, he moves in closer. He's getting in behind this island. Now, this is not an American cruiser, this is not something that the Anago is particularly good at. But, it doesn't want to hand the initiative, any more than it already is, to the enemy team. So, you don't want to be hugging the island in the way that you would an American light cruiser. Because if you get too close to the island, you don't have those high ballistic arcs, you won't be able to fire over it. Just close enough, so that you're no longer detected. Speaking of which, he's just been pinged by Hydro. Hmm, somebody's close. I've no idea, it must be the Cleveland. Which brings me on to my next point. I have no idea why the friendly Asashio is lurking around here as much as he is. I mean, there's a Cleveland and a Baltimore over there. They both have radar. He's just been pinged by the Cleveland Hydro. The only thing down there he could torpedo is the Bismarck, but the Bismarck's got an island between him and anything, and Hydro is running. So, oh, speaking of Hydro, I think we're about to solve our Hydro problem. Not quite sure what the Cleveland thought he was going to achieve by doing that, but, well... Whatever it was, it didn't work. The Asasio just managed to miss that Gneisenau over there with uh, his deepwater torpedoes. He's got more deepwater torpedoes going for the Bismarck, who is on 4,000 health and burning, so that's a complete waste of time. And oh, oh, did I mention that the Atago also has a fairly vulnerable citadel? <laughs> yeah, another reason why you want to keep this thing as far away from a battleship as you possibly can. See if we can get some fires, or additional fires, at least set on that Gneiser now, because he's going to burn down quite nicely. And... Yeah, we can, and yep, yeah, that worked out very well indeed. So the team are rallying somewhat, although not very much. And it's mostly only doing all the carrying. And it's not going to last for long. 
Lexington torpedo bombers closing in. Only's just popped its fighter consumable. Yeah, the anti-aircraft guns on the Attica aren't particularly good, but it does get the fighter consumable at least. And there's a Baltimore nearby. And a Bismarck. And they do have very good anti-aircraft guns. There was a Cleveland nearby as well, unfortunately. Well, you can see him sinking right there outside the smoke screen, which presumably has been deployed by the Asashio. More fires set, more modules knocked out. Some actual aircraft shot down. Wow, who would have guessed it? Now you can see that the Lexington is making a torpedo strike on the Bismarck, which means the Bismarck has been forced to turn away from the incoming torpedoes and is giving broadside to that lot. Now that would normally be quite bad. Well, not that bad. I mean, it could be, but the only thing that could really set it out of Bismarck from that kind of range would be the Vladivostok. You see, the Bismarck's turtleback armour arrangement largely renders it immune to citadels when it's at medium or close range. It's more effective the closer you are to the target. At that kind of range, the Vladivostok could potentially have citadeled the Bismarck, but he managed to weather the storm. The Vladivostok was more interested in shooting at Oni, and he missed. And Oni was firing back at the Vladivostok, and didn't. So the Vladivostok is down. And of course the Atago and the Kuznetsov over there with the Vladivostok, who very, very sensibly kept to their distance and didn't charge in like the Vladivostok did, were unloading as much high explosive as they could as quickly as possible. Uh, which certainly hurt the Bismarck, but he's managed to get away. Oh, and there's the Baltimore. You're going to want to angle away because he's probably... Oh, actually he's not firing AP, he's firing high explosive, so angling isn't really going to matter. And of course only is firing high explosive back, and his high explosive is a damn sight better than the Baltimore's. And, mm, yeah. Bye bye Baltimore. So, kill number four, the Baltimore. The enemy team are going to win in about three minutes. They're ahead 400 points, they control two of the caps, but the team have managed to at least swing one of the caps back, and that Atago is just begging for an armour-piercing broadside. Like that. that. That was indeed a paddling. But hang on a second. Torpedoes. Pop the hydro. I mean, it's a bit like shutting the barn door after the horse has bolted, but oh, hello. Those must be torpedoes from the Akatsuki, but wait, he's 8.7 kilometres away. Nobody's using radar. Nobody left alive on the team has radar. He's outside the Bismarck's hydro range, and the Bismarck is definitely running hydro, so the torpedoes are probably not going to hit anything. But this guy actually started shooting. <laughs> oh, there's two of the little buggers up there. Oh, <laughs> well. <laughs> well, there was two of the little bug, or rather, there were two of the little buggers up there, but that's what happens. When you get that close to a Bismarck secondaries and you decide to announce your location by shooting at him for no apparently good reason. So the Akatsuki's down, there's the Little Evil, who of course does not have a smokescreen, and isn't within range of the Bismarck secondaries. I guess he's just desperate for a Bismarck kill, but well... Did I mention how good the high explosive shells are on the Atago? Yeah, that French destroyer is getting smacked pretty hard. Unfortunately, we've just lost the Pensacola down to the south, and the Bismarck is almost certainly going to die. If the torpedoes don't get him, he's caught in a crossfire between the Terrebil and the Atago. But the Terrebil is not having much fun here either. And it's just a question of whether or not it's going to be the fire or the 8-inch high explosive that takes him out first. Okay, the Terrebil is down, but we have, as predicted, lost the Bismarck. That was fairly obvious, really. But he at least managed to take the Atago down with him. So well done to him, he's got two kills. Only, of course, is on five, but was spotted, and something was targeting him. Both teams are now down to three ships. The Asashio is finally making himself useful and is capping Bravo, but the enemy team do have a rather significant points advantage. 500 of them. The Asashio contesting Bravo, however, has at least bought them time, but not much. Before the Asashio went into that cap circle, the enemy team were going to win in less than two minutes on points. Now... They've got just about three minutes to do something. Unfortunately, only has less than 5,000 health remaining. Even more unfortunately, there's the enemy Auber with nearly five times the amount of health that Oni has, and he's flipping Charlie. Which means that right now, the enemy team is the only team that have any points coming in. Oni's advantage, of course, is that the Auber didn't know he was here. And he's not messing around <laughs> with the high explosive when he's got a broadside target like that to shoot at. Armour piercing, all the way. Just try not to die when the Auber shoots back. Bang! That was a paddling. Oh, crap. Let's not forget about the Kuchizov. 
but it looks like he's gotten away with it. With the death of the Alba, the Kuchizov is now firing blind. He's lobbing the shots over the island. There is no direct line of sight. So the Kuchizov is going to need to get... Ex in fact, I don't even think he can fire anymore. I'm pretty sure that the uh, peak of the island over there is now blocking the shots, even if he was firing blind. And now for the first time in this match, Oni's team actually have the advantage. I mean, they're still 500 points behind. The enemy team are still going to win in three minutes. Unless, and the Asashio's done it, he slips into the cap circle. The Asashio has actually done very well in this game. I mean, he hasn't done any damage to anything, but he has been instrumental in ensuring that the team have not yet already lost. Because he took Bravo, and now he's preventing the enemy team from gaining any further points by contesting Alpha. And I'm not entirely sure what the Lexington on the enemy team is doing about it, because... Unless I'm very much mistaken, he's he's attacking the friendly Lexington and completely ignoring the destroyer that just solo capped Bravo and is in the process of solo capping Alpha. So, you know, long may that continue. Never interrupt the enemy when they're making a mistake. But here's where things get really dangerous. If that Kutuzov, and he has seen him, and the guns are pointing this way, if that Kutuzov has loaded the armor piercing, but no, he's firing high explosive. Now, Oni was really unlucky to only get the one Citadel there, but it's a question of who's going to reload first, and, well, he's angling away in anticipation of some armor-piercing coming in his direction. He's got a second salvo out, obviously using adrenaline rush. He's got the Kutuzov, and nope, he's still firing high explosive. And didn't even set any fires. Not that it would have mattered, because Oni's damage control is off cooldown. Doesn't have an awful lot of health left, however. Might be a good idea to stay the hell away from that Lexington's aircraft. I mean, he was thinking about heading down in that direction, but soon put the rudder hard over in the other direction and is putting as much distance as possible between him and anything that might be able to detect and hit him and sink him from the air. And it looks like the Asashio um, is doing exactly the same thing. He's flipped Alpha. He's still got plenty of health, but why take chances? There's three minutes of this game left. As long as nothing else happens, Oni's team... And he's just been recognised in chat. <laughs> Presumably by some of his followers on Twitch. But Oni's team are going to win with a couple of seconds to spare on points, despite the 200-point lead that the enemy team still holds over them. They're going to win with just a couple of seconds to spare as long as nobody else dies, and they just ride out the clock. So the Asashio is sitting quite happily in A... And Oni is heading as far away from that Lexington as he possibly can. It's technically possible that the enemy team could still win. But in order to do that, the Lexington's going to have to sink Oni, and he's going to have to sink the Asashio. And to be completely honest here, that enemy Lexington should have sunk the Asashio five minutes ago, when he was flipping Bravo. But instead, he's having a bit of a punching match with the friendly Lexington, and just completely ignoring... The guys who were actually winning the game up to the north and the west. And that's fine. Like I said, never interrupt the enemy when they're making a mistake. So, because they weren't dropped on their heads when they were children, Oni and the Asashio are going to do just that. They're going to stay the hell away from the Lexington, and they're going to run the timer down and win on points. And if that was all that happened in the rest of this game, that would have been good enough. I mean, God knows, Oni has certainly earned the win with his six kills and 200,000 damage. But that's not all that lies in store for us before the end of this match. You see, the friendly Lexington has decided that just winning isn't enough. He's decided that the enemy Lexington doesn't deserve to survive. The thing is, they've been going at each other for the best part of the last five minutes with no end in sight. I mean, you know how hard it is to kill an aircraft carrier these days. But if you absolutely definitely do have to sink something, and you don't have all day to wait around in which to do it, you could just go to ramming speed. And with just 12 seconds of the match to go, that's exactly what the friendly Lexington does. Well done, that Lexington. Non shall pass and all of that. And of course, well done to Oni as well. With more than 200,000 damage, and nearly 3,500 base experience earned. That was a fairly decent match by anybody's standards. And as I said earlier, if you like what you've seen and you want to see some more, link down below in the video description to Only the Wicked's Twitch channel. Only, thank you for sending that one in. Congratulations. Well played, everybody else. Hope you enjoyed it. And as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.